Good evening. Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 186 from your hardback hymnal, number 186. The church is one foundation. Let's all stand together. 186. <clears throat> The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own One Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace and due. Mid toil and tribulation, and tumult of her war. She waits the consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. Please be seated. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis, uh, Galatians, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, <clears throat> the end of chapter 4, and then we'll read into chapter 5. <clears throat> the Lord tells us that where his spirit is, there's liberty. And in another place, he tells us that if Christ makes you free, you're free indeed. I, I hope the spirit of God will bless his word to our hearts and enable us to be free and have liberty in Christ. Um, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4 at verse 29. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so... It is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now we know the Lord's talking about Hagar and Ishmael and Abraham's thinking that he needed to help God out brought in this child of the flesh and the, uh, the promised child would be born miraculously and uh, the promise would come through him. So then, brethren, 
We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to Sinai. Look to Christ. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now we know that circumcision is any work performed by men to to earn favor with God. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you think that your recommendation to God is going to be through law keeping, you got to keep it all, every bit of it. Not just in outward actions, but inward, inwardly in the heart. And if we have some thought of recommending ourselves to God by our law keeping, then Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are, justified by the law, for you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait. We wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Romans chapter 10, Christ himself is the end of the law for righteousness. We're waiting for that righteousness. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. Let's pray. Our gracious, glorious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that the hope of our salvation is not in anything that we do. Lord, what what fear what bondage there would be, what liberty we have in knowing that Christ Jesus, the Lord, thy dear Son, the hope of our salvation, finished all that you required. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would give liberty. We pray that you would cause your word to be alive and effectual and quick and powerful. Lord, that our hearts be drawn in love this hour, finding our real hope and our rest in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 44 in the Spiral Gospel Hymns hymn book. Number 44. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> Precious Savior, friend of sinners, we as such to thee draw near. Let thy spirit dwell within us with that love that casts out fear. Matchless Savior, let us know thee as the Lord our righteousness. Cause our hearts to cleave unto thee. Come and with thy presence bless. Open now thy precious treasure. Let thy word here freely flow. Give to us a gracious measure. Tis thyself we long to know. Come and claim us as thy portion, 
Let us all find rest in thee. Leave us not to empty notions. We would find our hope in thee. Please be seated. Thank you, Tom. That was a very appropriate hymn. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles to J John chapter 2. John chapter 2. We started last Wednesday night, as the Lord enables, looking at the, the miracles recorded in the Gospels that our Lord performed and uh, we see in this miracle at the end in verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. <clears throat> John concludes his uh, gospel by saying many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. And that believing you might have life through his name. So the Lord not performing these miracles in order to try to, try to persuade someone to believe on him. Uh, he manifests his glory through these miracles to his disciples. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember reading this, uh, this text last Wednesday night, so let's read it together. I could, not, I could not move on to the second miracle. I thought when we started that I would just bring one message from each miracle, but it may not happen that way. Uh, there's so much in this miracle. This miracle is so glorious and it's so simple and it's so comprehensive. Uh, a proper understanding of this miracle gives us an understanding of everything. Um, let's read it together. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it come, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. <clears throat> everything in God's purpose the existence of of us and all of creation for that matter is about a marriage the father chose for his son a bride in the covenant of grace before time ever began the Lord Jesus entered into that covenant as the bridegroom and promised to do what was necessary to redeem that bride to himself. The Holy Spirit 
entered into that covenant and promised to take the message of the gospel and apply it effectually to the hearts of those whom the Father chose and those whom Christ redeemed and bring them to faith into a loving union with their husband. When the last of God's elect for whom Christ died is called by God's grace, then the end will come. There'll be no need for this world or for anything else. Uh, it's all about a marriage from beginning to end. We see in Revelation chapter 19 that when the consummation of time takes place, the bride is brought together to the bridegroom and there's a great wedding. There's a great marriage feast of the bride, the bridegroom. The bride has made herself ready and she comes and sits at the table with her husband. <clears throat> this miracle speaks of that. This, the beginning of miracles, this overarching miracle, this miracle that our Lord performed purposefully at the beginning of his ministry to declare that glorious truth. It happened at a wedding. Um, the other thing we see in this miracle is that the Lord is not on our time. Uh, Mary knew who the Lord Jesus was. And she thought perhaps she could nudge him uh, into, his, into his public ministry. And of course she would have thought what the other disciples thought, that, that the Lord was going to reestablish the, the kingdom of David on earth and that he was going to take his rightful place and and the, the Romans were going to be overthrown and Israel was going to become once again the greatest nation of the world. That's what she would have thought. Uh, and our Lord made it clear to her that, uh, that he was on his own time schedule. And how often we need to be reminded of that. We, we see things from a temporal perspective and we sometimes think that it ought to be this way or it ought to be that way. And, uh, and the Lord would say very lovingly and very gently to us, uh, my kingdom's not of this world. Um, what have I to do with thee? My hour's not yet come. Uh, when it's time for me to uh, perform uh, what I've purposed for you, I'll do it. And I'll do it, I'll do it perfectly. Um, what an encouragement that the Lord would speak to his mother this way and, and, uh, and have the same affection for not just his mother, but for his brothers and his sisters. When, who is my mother, who is my brother? They, all that they believe upon me, that's my, that's my family. Um, how many times we're reading God's word and it came to pass <laughs> and it came to pass. What came to pass? The purpose of God came to pass. The Lord had already, had already ordained it and only in his time does it come to pass. And so it is in your life and in my life. Uh, when our Lord said to those disciples, it's not for you to know the time of the season. You go back into Jerusalem, you wait for the Holy Ghost to come upon you, and, and he'll give you power, and you'll be my witnesses, and, 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 and in God's time, <laughs> in God's time. Uh, in Proverbs, it says, a man deviseth his ways, but God orders his steps. You know, we make our plans. And James tells us that when we make our plans, we should always remember, if it be the Lord's will, we'll do this and we'll do that. Um, we'll go to this city and we'll buy and we'll go to that city and we'll sell. We're always, always waiting on the Lord uh, to, to perfect his, his ordained purpose. And we know we know this. We know that he works all things together for good. 
for them that love him and those that are called according to his purpose. So we see some of that in this miracle, don't we? This miracle understood summarizes the entire Bible. <clears throat> the whole purpose and work of God is seen in what our Lord performs here in this beginning of miracles. There are six water pots. These are not, these are not base type water pots. They're more like large sinks or almost like bathtubs, 25 gallons maybe or so in each one. And they would have been lined up on a, in an area and they were for ceremonial washing. And they were stone. Well, we know what the number six is the number four. Man was created on the sixth day. And when the Lord speaks of man, he, he refers to us as six, six, six. <laughs> oh, doesn't that, doesn't that summarize so much of our, of our nature? Outside of grace and outside of the work of God. And I mean, it's all about us, isn't it? Six, six, six. <laughs> man, man, man. Uh, there's six water pots. And... Uh, and they're stone, they're, they're rigid, they're inflexible, they, they're, they're unmovable. They, they, they represent not just man, but his obligation to the law. What are these people doing? They're, they're trying to fulfill the law. They're ceremonially washing their hands in an attempt to satisfy the demands of the law. And what did the Lord Jesus say? He said, fill them to the brim. Fill them up. I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. I came to satisfy all the demands of the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I'm going to, I'm going to silence the condemnation of the law. I'm going to satisfy everything that God requires in the law. Adam, were talk, Adam and I were talking about this last Wednesday night. <clears throat> Notice in, um, in verse 8, And he said unto them, Draw out now. Now, I, I think it's significant that in John chapter 4, when the Lord said to the woman at the well, If you knew who it was that saith unto thee, give me to drink, you would ask of him and he would give you, he would give you living water. And, and the woman at the well said, this well is deep and you've got nothing to draw with. Now that's the only other place in the New Testament where this word draw is used. To take water from a vessel is to baptizo, it's to dip water out. The water here, the water here, the scripture here, the Lord tells the servants, now go draw out. Now, we can't be dogmatic about it because the Lord has left it somewhat veiled. But I sure like to think of these servants not drawing that water out of those six stone water pots that have been filled to the brim, but going back to the well, to that inexhaustible source of living water, not this dirty water where your hands have been washed, but rather the water that's coming from the aquifer, the, the, the living water, and they take that to the, to the, uh, to the master of the, of the wedding. And they knew, the servants knew where the water came from. And that's the important part. We know where the wine came from. I'm sorry. I've titled this message, The Lord Christ is the new wine. He is this wine. And this water changing to wine is the simplicity, the simple message of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to fulfill the law so that we are no longer under the law. The master of the ceremony said, he went to the bridegroom, he said, so I don't understand. <laughs> men always put out the good wine first, and then after, after men have drunk, then they bring out the, the, 
the wine that's not so good. But you've saved the best for last. I was thinking about in the book of Hebrews how the word better is a is a a word that's used over and over and over again in the book of Hebrews. And it is the theme of the book of Hebrews. And if there's any book that ties all of Scripture together, it would be the book of Hebrews. And uh, how oftentimes we read the word better in, uh, in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, uh, the, Lord, the, the, the Lord speaking of himself says that he's better than the angels. For which of the angels has God said, Thou art my son, I have begotten thee? So the Lord Jesus is referred to as the one who's better than those other angels. Hebrews chapter 7, when you know, the Jews would have thought, Abraham, you can't get any better than that. But the Lord reminds them about the encounter that Abraham had with Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was without mother and without father and without descent, he was, the, he was the, the king of Salem and the prince of peace. And, 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 and Melchizedek, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And in Hebrews chapter 7, the Lord tells us, the lesser is always blessed by the greater. Pointing out that it's not Abraham that's to be exalted here. It's our Melchizedek. It's the Lord Jesus that we look to for all the blessings of grace. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18, the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of better hope did by which we draw nigh to God. The law never made anything perfect. We have a better hope than the law. These Jews at this wedding <clears throat> were thinking that somehow we're going we're gonna to satisfy the demands of the law if we just wash our hands enough times. And, uh, and the Lord is saying to them, oh no. <laughs> no. The best has been saved for last. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, the Lord tells us that Jesus was made a surety. A surety is one who fulfills everything required. He was made a surety of a better covenant, a better testament. So this, this miracle of changing water into wine... Our Lord is, is glorifying himself as the one who came to satisfy all the demands of God's law so that we don't have to live in bondage under the fear of the law. Uh, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. They, the demands of the law have been met. They've been satisfied. We've been set free. Stand fast in the liberty. We read that in Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast in the liberty where the Christ has made you free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 23, the Lord tells us that the pattern of the things in heaven were purified by the blood of animals. Speaking of that old covenant. The pattern... The temple, the sacrificial system, everything was a pattern given to Moses from the substance which was in heaven. And so the pattern was purified by the blood of animals. And then the scripture goes on to say, but the heavenly things themselves, the substance of those patterns, the, the, the mercy seat that's in heaven, the requirements that God has, by a better sacrifice, a better sacrifice. 
And the Lord Jesus came and laid down his life. Uh, no more need for the shedding of animal blood. All the requirements of that eternal covenant were met through his blood. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. <clears throat> the Lord's saying to his church, you, you took joyfully the, the spoiling of your goods uh, when, when you were mistreated because of, because of your belief in Christ. And when they took away your job and they took away your possessions, you, you did that joyfully. Why? Why? Because you knew that you had in heaven a better and more enduring substance. A better substance, an enduring substance, a substance that no man can take from you. What is that substance? Well, it's Christ. He's our life. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, the Old Testament saints are called strangers and pilgrims, and, uh, and they wandered about in this world, but they were desiring a better country, a country that is heavenly. They sought a city whose builder and maker was God, a city with half, which hath foundations. Christ is the foundation of that heavenly city. So our Lord is saying in this first miracle, here's who I am and here's what I came to do. I came to fulfill all the types and pictures. God who at sundry times and in divers manners had had, had revealed himself to our fathers and spoken to our fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God has been manifested in the flesh, and he's come in order to fulfill all those legal requirements. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35, the Old Testament saints were tortured and they were, they endured that torture because they had a, they, they had the hope of obtaining a better resurrection. They were looking for that heavenly city. <clears throat> God provided better things for us, 11, Hebrews 11 verse 40. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. So here's what our Lord's doing. He's glorifying himself by satisfying the demands of the law. The scripture said that he would make the law honorable, and that's exactly what he did. David, speaking prophetically in Psalm 119, said, I shall keep the law continually. David never kept God's law any more than you did or I did. I have. He's speaking of Christ, the son of David, would, would keep the law of God continually. The threats of the law have been silenced. We no longer have to live in the bondage of fear. Calvary has quenched the fire of Sinai. <clears throat> Why do we need to hear this? Because there's something in us that would gravitate back to the law if the Lord doesn't remind us time and time again to stand fast in the liberty with I've made with Christ has made you free. And what? The best examples I know of that in the scriptures, number one would be Elijah. Elijah on Mount Carmel had experienced a glorious manifestation of God's power when the fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the sacrifice quenched the fire and the prophets of Baal were, were, were put to death and, and then Jezebel, <laughs> threatens Elijah 
And what's Elijah do? He runs back to Mount Horeb. From Carmel to Horeb, that's a long way. Now Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. It's the same mountain. And when Elijah's on Mount Horeb, the Lord does speak to him. And the first thing the Lord says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing? Why would you come back? <laughs> you came back to the law, to the, to the mountain of the law in order to try to, in order to, try to escape the, the fear of, of, this, of this woman. Do we not do the same thing? You want to think I'll, I'll, I'll step up my activity. I'll, I'll do better. I'll, rather than looking in faith to Christ, we, we, we believe the accusations of the, of the accuser of the brethren and, we, and we're so easily taken back to the law. A better example of that, and we've, we've looked at this recently, is Acts chapter 21. And Acts chapter 21 happened after the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, and after the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and after the Apostle Paul had to confront uh, Peter in, in Antioch, because you remember Peter got up from the table of the, of the Gentiles and went over and sat on the table of the Jews and, and Paul saw it happen and Paul realized that that one simple act did what? It mixed law and grace. And if it be of works, Romans chapter 11 verse 6, it can no longer be of grace. Otherwise, grace is not grace. You can't mix law and grace. It's one way or the other. What did Paul do in Acts chapter 21? He comes back from his missionary journey and he reports to James and the other apostles that are there in Jerusalem of the wonderful things that the Lord had done in these Gentile cities and how many Gentiles had been converted. And James says, well, look at all the thousands. <laughs> you know, most of these churches, the church at Galatia, the church at Ephesus, church, for these would have been small gatherings, much like the churches are today. They weren't large churches. Um, the church of Jerusalem would have been a large church, and James was somewhat proud of it. He said, he said, look at the thousands of Jews that have believed, and they are zealous for the law. And the report is, Paul, that you are out there telling the Gentiles that they don't have to keep the law. And so in order to quiet the accusations that are being made against you, uh, we've got some brothers here that are preparing to do a Nazarite vow. Now that was an Old Testament picture of what would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. This was years after Paul wrote Romans. This was years after he wrote Galatians. This was after he confronted Peter. Was there anybody on the face of the earth that understood the fulfillment of the Nazarite vow any more than the Apostle Paul? And yet, he said, all right, I'll do it. I don't want, I don't want to be accused of being an antinomian. I don't want to be accused of being lawless. I don't want to be accused of being, you know... Uh, uh, advocating sinful behavior, so whatever we have to do, you know, I, I guess maybe he's thinking I'll be all things to all men that I might win some. And he agrees to take this vow, which would have ended in a blood sacrifice. That was part of the Nazarite vow. The Apostle Paul was prepared to make a blood sacrifice. Lord stopped him, didn't he? A riot broke out. What is my point? We get accused of being lawless. Worst thing we can do is go back to the law to defend ourselves. Say, well, you know what? <laughs> Worst thing. 
stand fast in the liberty where the Christ has made you free. We don't have to we don't have to justify. You know, I, I we talk about grace, pure grace, and I've heard I've heard preachers say, Well, this is no license for sin, and I've intimated that. This is no license of course it's not, but what do, what are we doing when we talk like that? <laughs> We're robbing grace of its glory and of its simplicity and of its freedom and of its liberty when we, when we start, when we start uh, conditioning grace by saying, well, you know, it doesn't mean that you can do this or it doesn't mean, of course it doesn't. But why, why do we have to do that? Let's just, <laughs> let's just make grace free. It is free. It is free. The Lord Jesus himself is this new wine, and he, he is the power of God that will work in us and that will cause us to will and to do after his good pleasure. It is the love of Christ that constraineth us. It is the law of the Spirit. It's the law of grace. That, that, that constrains us and that motivates us. We don't need, we don't need the, the heavy hand of the law in order to, you know, you don't have to put a loving husband under the law to get him to come home to his wife at night. <laughs> you know, love doesn't, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's what the scripture says. We don't have to condition grace and love with, with the law. Men that do that are mixing law and grace. And these things cannot be mixed. It's like oil and water. You know, and all the, all the activity of legalistic religion is for the sake of you know, it's like when you take oil and water and you shake it up and then all of a sudden it becomes one substance. And you think, well, there, it's, you know, you can't tell the difference. You just set that thing down for a few minutes, see what happens. The water's going to come right to the surface. I mean, the oil's going to come right to the surface, isn't it? You try, drink, you try drink, taking a drink out of that glass, you're not going to have your, quench, your thirst quenched. You're going to get a mouthful of oil. You can't. You can shake it up all you want, but you can't mix. You can't mix works with grace. It's either all of grace or it's all of works. And better men than you and me have been, have been tempted. This, is, this, is, this miracle <laughs> explains the whole Bible. It explains the whole work of God from the very beginning all the way through to the end. Christ Jesus came to fill up those water pots and to draw out the new wine, the new wine. And the Lord Jesus himself said, you don't take new wine. You know, we think of wine as the aged wine, the older wine would be the better wine. But in the Bible, when the scripture speaks of new wine, it's talking about Christ. Let me show you that. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65. Look with me at verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. It's a cluster of grapes, and there's a new wine in one of those grapes. Let's don't destroy the whole cluster because we'll destroy the new wine. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10, speaking of the believer's life of faith and trusting God, and then the Lord says, So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses will burst with new wine. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the wine press and he pressed out that wine. This is the new wine. This is the, 
You've saved the best for last. <laughs> we don't understand. I know you won't understand. And the Lord Jesus said you don't take new wine and put it in an old wineskin. Now wineskins would have been made from the, from the stomachs of sheep or from, from some sort of leather. And, and when you put new wine into a wineskin, it <laughs> ferments in the skin and it expands the skin. And, uh, and then that skin would dry out eventually in its expanded state. And at that point, if you put new wine into an old wineskin, it's just going to, when it ferments, it's going to burst. What is the Lord saying? I'm the new wine. And I didn't come to put myself in the law or to mix my grace with works. <laughs> and I didn't come in order to, it, we, we read the, from, from what Abraham thought in Galatians chapter 4 Abraham thought I'll I'll try to help God out I'll put my hand to it I'll I'll see if I can you know make this God does his part I'll do my part that's what the Lord's saying about the new wine you don't put new wine in an old wine skin we're the old wine skin the Lord has to make a he has to make a new heart <laughs> He didn't come in order, to, in order to improve the old. You don't put a, you don't put a new patch on, a, on an old piece of garment because when that new patch shrinks, it's going to make the hole that you use to stitch that old garment up, it's going to make it bigger. The Lord Jesus did not, did not come to help us to keep the law. He did not come in order to help us to improve our lives. He did not come to fix our problem. He came to change everything. And that's why I think this wine came out of the well. He said, go draw. <laughs> go draw water. And take it to the master. A new wine has been found in the cluster. <laughs> Destroy it not. There's a blessing in it. There's a blessing in it. You see, grace, grace has to be completely new. It has to be completely separate. It can't have anything to do with our works. And the Lord didn't come in order for us to help him out so we could be better people. He came to give us life. He came to raise us from the dead. He came to give us liberty and freedom and love and grace and hope and salvation. And it all is new. If any man be found in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become new. All things have become new. <laughs> We've been set free from the law. We're not under the law. The law's been full. It's been, it's been satisfied. We're under grace. Oh, how much better is grace? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I've heard Reformed Calvinist very well educated and very and very popular reformed calvinist say that they didn't understand the book of hebrews to me it's the clearest simplest book in the bible it ties it all together why would a reformed calvinist not understand the book of hebrews cuz they're still under the law and the whole message of the book of hebrews is is that Christ came to fulfill the law. And we have a better covenant now. But they're holding on to some covenant theology and some covenant doctrine and trying to carry these Old Testament laws over to the new and they mix the two and they destroy the gospel. And they make, they make sanctification progressive and they make the law, they bring in the law through the back door. You know, well, well yeah, we're free in Christ, but... And then they monitor and motivate and measure your progress as a Christian by putting you under the law. 
No wonder they don't understand Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. We'll begin reading at verse 9. I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. The conscience is the heart. See, men think, well, I, the law is like a policeman. Seth, I mean, I'm sure you've had this spirit in me. You pull out in your squad car and everybody slows down. You guys cause accidents. You call, you, it, to me, it causes more danger on the highway. A cop pulls out and everybody starts slowing down. And everybody back, you know, just let them go. It's safer, I think. But what happens? Everybody takes their foot off the gas. There's a police officer in my rearview mirror. And as soon as he pulls off and goes somewhere, everybody's back to their lawless ways. Back to their lawless ways. And that's all the law does. You put a man under the law, it may... It may restrain his outward behavior for a little while, but it doesn't speak to the conscience. Because that guy's heart that's watching you in his rearview mirror, he's ready for you to get off the road so he can get back. He, his heart's not changed. His behavior may be changed a little bit. We need, we need a new heart. And that only happens by grace. Doesn't happen by the law. Now, I'm not saying we don't need police officer. We don't need the law. Be Why? Because we're a bunch of lawless people. And we got to have the law. But men that are under grace don't need the law. They don't need the law. They've had their hearts changed. They've got it. They've had, it speaks to the conscience. You see, the writer of Hebrews is referring back to the previous chapters about all these Old Testament types. And he's saying, now look at, look at, uh, Look at verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And that word is not referring to what happened 500 years ago over there in Europe. That was not a reformation. The old to reform. The Catholic Church has never been reformed. And the people who call themselves reformed now have got so much baggage from Roman Catholicism and legalism in their churches. They, there's nothing reformed about them. To reform something means that you take one thing and change it into something else. The Lord Jesus took water and changed it into wine. He was saying to us that all these types in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law, the moral law, the, 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 the civil law, the dietary law, all these laws, <laughs> he came to fulfill them. And there's the reformation from outward ordinances to an inward work of grace. Verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls, uh, goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of hefters sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, not to you and me, he offered himself to God. And God saw the travail of his soul and God said, I'm satisfied. And that's what purges our conscience of dead works. That's what gives us liberty. Sanctifying to the purifying of uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. We have the Spirit of God. We've got Christ. We've got something so much better than the law. So much better. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. That's how we receive the promise, by grace. If my inheritance has anything to do with anything I do, I've got no hope. I've got no comfort. I've got no grace. It's all on what he did. The moral law. First, first four laws having to do with our relationship with God. Oh, we have Christ. What, what, is our, our, what is our obligation to God? It's to worship him. It's to worship him. What, do you have to have a law? Do you have, to, do you have to have a commandment from God in order to cause you to, to gather together to worship him or to pray or to seek his face? you have the spirit of God you don't and the rest of the law love is the fulfillment of the law love will do no injury to your neighbor (laughs) the heavy hand of the law only increases rebellion the best example of that is those taskmasters in Egypt there, that's, that's, the, that's the Old Testament picture of the law, isn't it? The children of Israel under the law. God's going to set them free. <laughs> um, and, and the scripture says that, that when they came close to meeting their quota of making bricks, the taskmasters increased their quota and took away the straw. <laughs> you can never satisfy the demands of the law. So if you're put under a law that you can't ever satisfy, all you're going to do is resent that law. That's all you're going to do. That's why the Bible says the strength of sin is the law. Because the law only increases our rebellion. It it increases our Our resentment. This beginning of miracles tells the whole story. Tells the whole story about who God is, who we are, what God's done to save sinners. And it tells a story that Only the servants who knew where that water came from and only the disciples who saw the glory of Christ in this miracle could enter into. No one else knew what was happening. Men who have but one nature, that's all they know is the law. By God's grace, pray the Lord will set us free and uh, give us liberty. Let's, Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to the hearts of your people, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Tom? 27 in the Sproul hymn, the number 27. from
from the law's great curse. In Jesus we are free. For Christ became a curse for us and died upon the tree. The rituals of the law and all the law's commands have been fulfilled in Christ the Lord, established by his hands. No covenant with the law can now with us exist. Complete in Christ we stand by grace, both free and ever blessed. No more the dread of wrath, no more constrained by fear. We worship and we serve our God with gratitude and cheer.